Well, good morning again. We're glad to have you here, especially if you're visiting with us. We're glad you're here with us today to worship our Lord and Savior. If you have a bulletin, we'll look at the announcements that we have in there today. And if there's any more we need to add, we'll do that today, too. Of course, the ladies' Bible study on Elijah is going on now. It's a seven-week study. So if you want to join the ladies on that, it's a, it's a 4 o'clock in the fellowship hall. And then May the 15th, it's a big, big day. It's going to be Wash Sunday. And all the information there is about that. It's going to be a big time. The Wash kids will be here, and we'll have a good time worshiping our Lord there. Playground Equipment Committee meeting today, Sunday, May the 1st, 3 p.m. in the fellowship hall. So if you're on that committee, be sure and be here and be a part of that. And, of course, next Sunday, May the 8th, is Mother's Day. And also, if we will not have night services next Sunday night, okay? Vacation Bible School is coming up June the 6th through June the 10th. And it says, need a helper for the first grade. So if you, if you could help with that, see Miss Evelyn about that. Okay, it has one helper. They need one more helper for that class. So if you could help with them, let her know, okay? And then Brother Kevin's got a new CD out called Heaven in View. If you'd like to have one of those, contact him, see him, and uh, get you a copy of that already. And this afternoon at 5 o'clock, we'll have a deacons meeting in the fellowship hall over here. And then next Sunday morning, after our Sunday morning service, we're going to have a special call business meeting, just a short one, to discuss the ice machine. So next Sunday morning, after our, we'll have a short call business meeting to discuss the ice machine. Any other announcements need to be made this morning? Okay, is there any prayer requests we need to mention this morning? We need to remember the Charles Sherrill family. Uh, Charles passed away. Bill Franks? Okay. Remember Bill Franks' family. Okay. Okay. Joanna Harris' family. Aaron. Heron, yeah, okay, the Heron, yeah, okay. Joanna Heron. George Mayfield. And when Bill Kanky, he called me yesterday uh, afternoon and uh, he, he spent a night up at the hospital in Mountain Home a week ago Friday night, but he, he took his son second booster shot and and he come home and I think he had a little spell so uh, remember Bill he's, he was going to try to make it today but he didn't make it so I guess he didn't feel like it this morning Heron Anyone else? Donnie, you do this in prayer this morning, please. Amen. Okay, uh, this is the first uh, Sunday of the month of May, and uh, those that uh, had a birthday in May, I'll give you this opportunity to be recognized, say you matured another year. Uh, all right. Oh. Okay. Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday.
birthday anniversaries in the month of May. <clears throat> All right, we've got two. Miss Kay, you want to share how long you've been been married this morning? Miss Kay, you want to share how many years? 54. 54. All right. Mm -hmm. Jared. 12. 12 years. All right. Happy anniversary to you. Revive us again. <laughs> Good morning, y'all. We're going to do a song for praise and worship this morning.
joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious Arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't he wonderful? Sing Christ is risen, bow down before him, for he is Lord of all, sing hallelujah, Christ is come to you this morning and we're thankful to be here in your house please bless the rest of this service lord in jesus name i pray amen any special music this morning all right miss patty Had to get rid of that baby, didn't you? Oh, I know that broke your heart to give it up.
Jesus so many years ago. The sweetest melodies drift back from heaven's door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what would I Maybe you got something on your mind this morning you'd like to share, a testimony, praising the Lord, giving Him some praise this morning. We'll give you a chance to do that right now. Kelly? That was a surprise, praise the Lord. Good, good surprise. Somebody else. Yes. A great grandmother. Woo. That's a blessing. You saw I, I saw the pictures. You sent me. You got it's a violin, I tell you. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. <laughs> I see people fanning out there. Y'all hot? You shaking your head? Yeah, you hot? A lot of work was accomplished yesterday. Church folks came out and and helped, and even some non-church folks came out and helped from other from another church. But uh, a lot was accomplished, and we really do appreciate those of you who helped. We'll go ahead and dismiss for children's church at this time. I'll check this air condition now, see if it's on or off. Or... Oh, everything's off. Okay, well, praise the Lord. God is good. And all the time. Today, if you have your Bibles, be turning to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, we're going to be looking at verses 2 through 12. Last week, we started a series of messages entitled, I Am... And our text was John chapter 6, and we looked at the first 
I am statement by Jesus. Now John records seven miracles of Jesus proclaiming who Jesus is and he is Christ the Son of God and that is proclaimed through the miracles that he performed and John records seven of those miracles. John also records seven I am statements and that is referring to what Jesus is to us as children of God. And last week we talked about that he was the bread of life. John chapter 6 verse 35 said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. That means that name, I am, takes us back to Exodus chapter 3. We talked about this last week. And if you remember the story, uh, God instructed Moses to rescue the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And, of course, Moses asked God, When I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me. And they said to me, Well, what is his name? What am I going to tell them? And God told Moses to tell them that I am sent you. I am sent you. I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am as sent you. And then he goes on, he says, when Moses asked God, well, who am I that I should deliver Israel from slavery? And God said, it's not a question of who you are, but it's a question of who I am. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you what somebody said, well, me and God do anything. No, honey, God can do anything himself. Amen. God can do anything himself. I'm just glad to be on the side of the Lord. Amen. Anyway, when Jesus declared his identity using the same I am that was used in the Old Testament, he was declaring his deity. He was declaring that salvation come by no other name except the name of Jesus Christ. And last week we said Jesus was the bread of life and that he saves us. Those were my three points. He saves us. He satisfies us and he strengthens us. Those were the three points last week when we talked about how Jesus is the bread of life. Now, when we talk about Jesus as the bread of life, it actually speaks to his provision. It speaks to his provision. If you remember, we talked about the manna that God provided for the children of Israel in the wilderness. We talked about that last week. Today, we're going to talk about that was provision. Today, we're going to see where Jesus tells us that he is the light of the world. And that speaks not to his provision, but it speaks to his path. It speaks to his path. So remember, I am changes who I am. I am changes who I am. So if you have our text this morning, John chapter 8, we're going to begin in verse 2. Say, I have that, Pastor. Would you stand in the reverence of the reading of God's word, John chapter 8 beginning in verse 2, and we'll read through verse 12. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something to which to accuse him of. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, and though he did not hear, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No, Lord, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then look at verse 12. 
Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We're so thankful for your word. Lord, may it sink deep into our hearts and change us. Lord, we pray that you'd anoint this time. We bind the hands of Satan in this place. Lord, we give you praise, honor, and let the Holy Spirit have complete reign in this place today. And we ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Have you ever walked into a dark room and cut the lights on and bugs went to scrambling everywhere? <laughs> Remember, we used to travel on a bus going from one church to the other singing and carrying on, but sometimes the bus would tear up, and we had our share of those instances. Emily probably remembers those when she was a baby, being dragged around from one place to another on that old bus. But sometimes the bus would tear up and we would have to rent a U-Haul trailer and pull it behind our truck or, our, or a van. And when that would occur, we didn't have anywhere to sleep because we had bunks on the bus that we slept on. But when we had the U-Haul trailer in the van, we would sleep in a hotel. And many times, Jeff, Jeff's deal, his idea was if you wait and drive to 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning and you find you a hotel, it's much cheaper. It's cheaper if you get in there late because, you know, rooms that they, they, they knew by that time we're not going to rent these rooms out, so you could kind of Jew with them a little bit. And so I remember one night we were in Alabama and we pulled in this hotel. It was about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And we were going to sing the next, the next morning. This was like on a Saturday night. And we pulled in the hotel. And he said, Kevin, you get out and see what you can get these rooms for. And so I got out and talked to the lady there at the window. That time of night, they won't let you in. You just had to push your button. And, and then you have to get them up, you know. They're, they're kind of been asleep. And so... I really couldn't get the room any cheaper, but anyway, we got us a couple of rooms, and uh, Evelyn's smiling up here because she knows exactly what I'm going to say. We went in one of those rooms and got the light on, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, they were little critters going everywhere, and there was no hot water. But anyway, those are the kind of hotels you do not want to spend your vacation on, amen? But anyway... That's exactly what happened in our text. That's what happened in our text. Jesus being the light of the world, he exposed their sin. He exposed their sin and they removed themselves from the light. Now, I don't know what he wrote in the sand. I don't know what he wrote in the dirt. But I can assume that maybe it was something about them, and they, when they saw that, perhaps maybe their sin, when they saw that, they decided they would, they would not hang around. Like those little bugs when you turn the lights on. They've got to find another dark place. But you know something? God did not create you to walk in darkness. God did not create us to walk in darkness. He created us to walk in the light. Jesus tells us in John chapter 12, verse 46, I have come as the light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide or remain in darkness. John 1, 4 and 5 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 9 of that same chapter, John chapter 1 says, That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. So what does that mean for us today? That Jesus is the light 
of the world. He who follows him shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. What does that mean for us? How does Jesus, being the light of the world, change our world and change what we do? You know, when I'm in a dark place, I have to get a flashlight. I have to get some type of light to light my way so that I can see where I am going. And as the light of the world, Jesus guides our steps. As the light of the world, Jesus, not only does he guide our steps, but he guards our steps. Well, how does he do that, preacher? How does Jesus, being the light of the world, guide and guard our steps? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to look at three things this morning. We need to look at the who, we need to look at the how, and we need to look at the why. Those three things we're going to look at. First of all, I want us to look at the who. Who steps does Jesus guide and guard? Who are we talking about? Who steps does he guide and guard? Well, the short answer is his people. His people. Those are whose steps he guides and he guards. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, he is our God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. And we his people and the sheep of his pasture. We are his people. You are the children of God. Those that he died for. Those that receive him as their Savior and Lord. Those who follow him. Those who worship him. Those who honor him. That's the people's steps that he guides and he guards. And if you're saved today, you are his people. Praise the Lord. Amen. So the who is his people. In Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire, To give them light. So as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day. Or the pillar of fire by night. From before the people. So wherever and whenever. The pillar of fire led them. Wherever it led them. They followed. They followed. When the pillar of fire stopped. Guess what? They stopped. When the pillar of fire began moving, they began moving. When the pillar of fire headed in a certain direction, they followed in that certain direction. Jesus was saying God's presence was a pillar of fire for Moses and our forefathers. But now he's saying the pillar of his presence is here in person. Jesus Christ is that pillar in which guides us and guards our steps. He's saying, I am is here. So what's he saying? I am is here to be the light of life. And he, Jesus Christ, is the light for those who have accepted him as their personal Lord and Savior. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were once in darkness, but now you're the light of the world. Walk as children of the light. Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is, not, is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Isaiah 60, 19 and 20, the Lord will be to you an everlasting light. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting life. And then Micah 7, 8 says, when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. So Jesus being the light of the world guides our steps, and he guards our steps. He guards those who follow him. That's what he said in verse 12. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. You know this word word translated follow here in this particular passage of scripture is in the present tense. And here's what that means. That means he who follows and keeps on following me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. So to follow Jesus means to accompany him. Do walk along beside him, to go after him. The question is this morning, are you following Jesus? Are you following Jesus? You're following something. We are people who follow. We're following something. 
But are you following Jesus? Are you standing where he stands? Are you going after him and continually pursuing him? You know, I can think back when Evelyn and I were dating. I pursued her. And I bet a lot of you men here in this room, if we could go back in a time that you first met your wife, how you pursued her. Well, the Bible talks about we should pursue Jesus, seek after him, walk along beside him, pursue him. That's what following is. So the who is his people. Next, I want us to look at the how. Have you ever prayed, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Have you ever prayed that prayer? Lord, what is it that you want me to do? You know, every day we're faced with a lot of decisions. You were faced with a lot of decisions coming to church this morning. But some of our decisions are decisions that impact our lives more than others. Some of the decisions that we make have a great impact on our lives, and they have a great impact on the lives of others. So how do we know what to decide to do? How do we know which path to follow? How do we know what to decide? On what basis do we make our daily decisions? Maybe a horoscope. Maybe that's, you can't wait to open that morning paper to see what your horoscope is for the day so you'll know how to make your decisions. I hope not, but some people, they look to their horoscope. Maybe it's the little eight ball. Do you remember Remember the little eight ball? You'd ask it a question and turn it upside down, and that thing would pop up there and you could look through there and it'd say yes, no, maybe or whatever you know. Remember that? Maybe that's how you base your decisions, your daily decisions on an eight ball. Maybe a palm reader. I remember going to Mississippi to visit there along 49 South. There's a big sign. I mean it's probably a, a 10 by 10 sign. Got a picture of a big old hand there and it says palm reader. Get your palm read today. Maybe you call one of those 800 or 900 numbers. I don't know what they are, but California, what do they call them? California psychics, that's it. Rick back there, he knows. California psychics. <laughs> no pun intended back there, Rick. Thank you. I need help. Maybe that's how you make your decisions, California psychics. I mean, how do you make your decisions? I mean, think about it. We make all kinds of decisions. We have to make decisions daily. How do we make our decisions? Well, for the children of Israel, it was the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. That's how they made their decision. That's how they knew where they were going, whether to travel this way or that way, whether to stop or go. That's how he led them. The question is, do you think God still leads his people today? Does God still lead his people today? I mean, did he leave us to turn the eight ball over or get a, our palms red or call the California psychic hotline? hotline or, I mean, did he leave that for us or did he leave another way, the best way in which we are to use to find what is the best decision for us to make. Does God still lead his people today? Does God have a pillar for us to, so we can know where to, for, for absolute certainty that it's him that's leading us and that it's him that's, that we're following does he have a pillow for us today like he did the children of Israel? And the answer is a resounding yes, he does. He does have a pillow for us today just as God led his people by those pillars and spoke to Moses from a burning bush. He still guides today. He still guards today. Listen, I want to tell you something. The bush is still burning today, amen. The bush is still burning. God is still speaking to his people. So how does he speak to his people today, preacher? How does he guide and guard us today? 
as the light of the world. Well, he does it in three different ways, and I'm going to share those three ways with you. One way he guides us and he leads us through his word. God has given us his word as a light today. What those pillars were to the children of Israel and what the bush was to Moses, the word of God is to us as his children today. Just as they look, they look to those pillars for guidance, we now look to God's word for guidance. That's why it's important that we learn the word of God. That's why it's important that we know the word of God. That's why it's important that we remember the word of God. That's why it's important that we put the Word of God in our hearts today because it is a way, it is a guide for us to use if we want to follow Jesus Christ and make the right decisions in this life. We are to put His Word in our hearts. But not only does He lead and guide us through His Word, He also does it through His Spirit. Talking about the Israelites, Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 20 says this. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. God gave them and guided them 40 years in the wilderness by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and his good spirit is what the scripture says. And what those pillars were to the children of Israel, God's word is to us and what his good spirit was to them in the Old Testament, God's Holy Spirit is for us today in the New Testament in this world in which we live in. He indwells in us and He instructs us. And the only difference now is we'll never lose the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. See, in the Old Testament, the Spirit came and went. The Spirit came and went as it was needed. It came, it came and it went. But let me tell you something. Since the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God has been poured out on the, all, all over the entire earth and it is here to stay. Amen. Listen, we can quench the Holy Spirit. We can quench the Holy Spirit by saying, no, I'll do that later and not now. We can grieve the Holy Spirit by having known sin in our life, unforgiven sin. And we can be filled with the Spirit when we confess and repent of our sin. But we can never, never, ever lose the presence of the Holy Spirit. God has when Jesus left, he sent the Holy Spirit back and he is here today, praise the Lord. And it leads us and it guides us if we will listen, amen. And then one final way he guides us and leads us is through his body. So what Moses was to them in the Old Testament, what Moses was to the children of Israel, his body is to us today. You could say it this way. God guides and guards us through the scriptures, through the spirit, and through the saints. If you wanted to use all S's, through the scriptures, through the spirit, and through the saints. See, when I talk about the body of Christ, I'm talking about you folks. The church is the body of Christ. And God uses his church as a way to guide us and to lead us. I've heard people say, well, the church is the bride of Christ. And in, from a relational type, from a relational standpoint, that's exactly right. The scriptures even talk about the bridegroom and the bride and so forth. But that is from a relational standpoint. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his mouthpiece. We are the body of Christ. That's the church. You are. You're the body of Christ in Calico Rock. And listen, people walk into this church every Sunday having carried the burdens of life all week long. And we have the opportunity as the church, as Jesus' body here in Calico Rock to help lighten their load. People walk into this church looking for godly guidance to their life's issues and we have the opportunity as the body of Christ to guide them in the truth. 
People walk into this church every Sunday longing to have peace with God and peace with themselves and peace with their fellow man. And we have the opportunity to point them to the one who can give them all peace, and that is Jesus Christ. He could have used the mountains. He could have used anything. But praise God, he organized and built his church, and it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I don't know about you, but I sure am humble to the fact that he decided to use us. Amen. So, that's how he guides, that's how he guards, that's how he leads through the word, through his spirit, and through his body. So we've talked about the who, God's people. We've talked about the how. Finally, let's talk about the why. Why does God guide us? Why does God guard us? Why does God lead us? Well, let's go back and look at the children of Israel again because last week, Jesus saying he was the bread, we went back and looked at the manna and how Jesus was, how the manna was symbolic of Jesus. And so far we, today, we've already talked about Jesus as the light of the world and how the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire by night was symbolic of Jesus. Let's go back and look at the children of Israel again and why God guided them and why God guarded them. Those 40 years through the wilderness from Egypt to the promised land. Why did God guide them? Why did God guard them? Well, he guided them and guarded them for the same reason he guides you and I today. And here it is. To accomplish his will. That's why. To accomplish his will. You know, I hate to bust some folks' bubble this morning. But it's not about you. It's not about me. The ministry of God is not about you. It's not about me. It's not about my will. It's not about your will. It's about accomplishing His will. Matter of fact, that's why you were created. That's why I was created. That's why every... Living being was created in the image of God. Those that were created in the image of God, special. You know you've never seen what your face looks like? You haven't. You've never seen your face. Think about it. Now, you've seen an image of your face, right? You've looked in the mirror and you've seen a reflection of your face. You've seen an image of your face. Somebody said, well, I don't know what God looks like. I do. I can look at you and tell what God looks like. Because we were created, the Bible says what? In his image. In his image. Now, I may not know all the particulars, but I, I kind of know what God looks like because I'm made in his image. And you're made in his image. But when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them a purpose. He gave them a mission. And every person since Adam and Eve has had the same purpose, the same mission, and that is to accomplish the will of God. See, too many folks today, the problem today is too many folks are trying to accomplish their will. I mean, that's the problem. That's the problem in churches. That's the problem in our nation. I mean, that's, that's the problem. Too many people are trying to accomplish their will, or maybe a will of an organization, or maybe a will of someone else. They're trying to do whatever it takes to accomplish someone else's will, except the will of God. The will of God is what every person was created to accomplish, and that's to accomplish his will. And you'll never be satisfied, inside, outside, or otherwise, you'll never be satisfied until you begin to follow in the reason you were created, and that was to accomplish the will of God. At home, at work, at school, a lot of people are trying other things. But the why to the reason God wants to guide and guard us is to accomplish His will. Now, some of you may be thinking, I wish I knew His will for my life. I wish I knew what His will for my life was. Well, I'm going to tell you what his will for your life is. Two things. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That's what, that's what Scripture says. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Colossians 4, 12 says, That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And then Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So, how do we accomplish His will in our life? Well, first of all, He wants us to become sanctified. The process of sanctification. And that word sanctification is where we get the same word holy from. Holy. To be sanctified or to be holy means to be set apart. Sanctification is being set apart from the world and set apart unto God. That's what sanctification means. That's why, that's what he's working to accomplish in my life. And sometimes, boy, he has a time. I mean, sometimes he has a time. I fight demons just like y'all fight demons. Any of y'all fight demons? Amen. Do you have to fight demons during the week? Amen. I have to do the same thing. I have demons inside of me sometimes. They can't possess me, but they oppress me, and I have to fight them. I have to fight them because I'm still in this fleshly body. I'm still human. And so I call them demons. I don't know. You may call them different things, but temptations or whatever, but I call them demons. And we fight demons even as children of God because we're living in a sin-cursed world. But sanctification is being set apart from the world and set unto God. And that's what he's working to accomplish in our lives, to sanctify us and to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Through his word, sanctifying and conforming us. Through his spirit, sanctifying and conforming us. Through his body, sanctifying and conforming us. Listen, honey, God is out to accomplish something special in your life. Just like the potter and the clay, he wants to create something beautiful. He's guiding and guarding your steps, not to make you happy. Oh, maybe I need to put that on my refrigerator too. He's not guiding and guarding me to make me happy. He's guiding and guarding me to make me holy. Mm. Sometimes that's hard to swallow. So why is God guiding his people? Well, for the same reason he's always guided his people, to accomplish his will. That's why he led the Israelites, and that's why he's leading his people today to accomplish his will. Now, there's one more reason he's guiding and directing and guarding us. The first one was to accomplish his will. The second one is to accept his word. To accept his word. The children of Israel struggled to accept God's word. And you know what? We're not much different today. It's easy to say we accept the Word of God in our life, but it's something else to show that we accept the Word of God in our life. Because either we believe the Word of God or we don't believe the Word of God. And if we believe the Word of God, it should change how we live. Amen? And you know something? As the persecution of Christians continues to increase... I think time is going to really tell who believes the Word of God or not, who truly believes in Jesus or not. That's why we need to saturate our minds with the Word of God. We need to saturate our minds with the Word of God until it alters our decisions, until it alters our choices. The truth is, if your life's choices and decisions are not reflecting God's Word, then you're not saturating your life with God's Word. You're substituting God's word you're believing a lie and not believing or living out the truth in closing this morning back in Exodus chapter 14 we read about or we read about the Red Sea incident everybody probably knows the story of the Red Sea and here's what was happening back then and I'll read it verses 19 through 21 Of course, Moses had led the the children of Israel out of Egypt and they were were headed. They were headed out of town. And what happened was, 
After they got out of town a ways, the king changed his mind. Remember the story? The king changed his mind and said, go get them. And so here he was with his army chasing the Israelites. And here's what it says in verses 19 through 21. It says, And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other. So that the one did not come near the other all that night. Verse 21 says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. Then verse 30 says, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Now, did you get what Scripture said? Moses came to the Red Sea. They couldn't go any further. The Red Sea was there. And the Egyptians was coming up behind them. And that pillar of cloud and that pillar of fire that was leading them, the Bible says that it came between the camp of the Israelites and the camp of the Egyptians. And it was darkness to the camp of the Egyptians, but it was light to the camp of the Israelites. He said it was so that they would not come near each other. The, the Egyptians could not come near the Israelites. God had protection over them. God had protected them from the enemy. Now, just as God used that pillar to guide and guard his children, he now guides and guards his people through his word, through his spirit, and through his body. But listen to what John 8, 12 says. Then Jesus spoke to them and saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Not only does he guide us and lead us, but he guards us. He guards us. He keeps us safe. He protects us. The question this morning is, are you following him? I want Evelyn to come to the piano because... There's a song that I learned as a child, and you probably learned as a child if you were in Sunday school. And it answers the question, are you following Jesus? And maybe somebody out there this morning needs to decide to follow Jesus. You need to decide today to follow Jesus. You've been searching for purpose. You've been searching for the why. The, why is God, why am I created? Well, to accomplish His will and to accept His word. Maybe you'd like to follow Jesus today if you're here and not following Jesus. Would you just bow your heads for just a moment? Give you an opportunity to come to this altar this morning. Maybe maybe you need to accept Him as your personal Savior. Maybe you need to pray for someone that God's laid on your heart to accept Him. I have decided to follow Jesus. Remember that song? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me. I still will follow Though none go with me I still will follow Though none go with me I still will follow No turning back 
no turning back. Are you following Jesus? He's the light of the world. Come out of that darkness. Take the blinders off. Spiritual blindness. And see. Jesus is the light. Would you stand with me this morning? Let's sing that I've decided to follow Jesus one more time. That that course I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you today.